Thank you, Ricardo. All right. Hi, everybody. Uh, like uh, Chris said, uh, it, it's exciting to see everybody here. Uh, so thanks for being here. Thank you, Ricardo, for putting all of this together. I think anyone who's done this before knows it takes a lot of time, a lot of effort, and we really appreciate it. So thank you. So my name is Scott Boylston, and as Ricardo said, I'm the graduate coordinator for design for sustainability at SCAD. Uh, and uh, a lot of what we talk about in the program is focused around systems and systems thinking. So this is uh, especially important to, uh, to our program. And I'd like to start with an observation. That's not the observation I'd like to start with. <laughs> That's the observation I'd like to start with. We're not systems thinkers. And, and, and in the spirit of what uh, Chris said in terms of complications, uh, we, we are constantly provoking our students to think more about what we think about and what we assume uh, in order to improve our practice. And uh, so today I'm going to be kind of also uh, providing some provo provo provocations. So this not, why do I say not? Well, it's not just me that says this. Uh, and Mariana, uh, Mariana Amatulo has done her PhD on what's called the design attitude. And her conversation over her PhD development has been exploring how designers in the field, a lot of practicing designers, embody certain uh, capabilities and abilities. This was her assumption. She had five things. And throughout her, her research, she looked for specific evidence for each of these ways of thinking. And you'll see that systems thinking is not on the list. What she found is that each of these ambiguity, uh, tolerance, um, connecting multiple perspectives, creativity, all of those were very evident across the board from senior designers, VPs to lower designers. It was all there. But systems thinking was missing. Yes, they thought about systems. Yes, they engaged in interaction between different departments, which could be considered a form of systems thinking. The systems thinking as at its essence, challenging certain assumptions about how we think was lacking. So uh, so the uh, what's interesting, and I want to add to this, uh, and, and we know, I, I think we can identify with all of these, perhaps with systems, perhaps not, but at least with the others. And the other thing that she was exploring was this idea that designers within this ambiguity tolerance we have a comfort level in divergent mode. We have a lot of people, and we know this, we work with a lot of people who are like, just got to get it done. Make a decision, make a decision, let's get going. We enjoy that space where we get a chance to explore and diverge. So that's an interesting opportunity because my suggestion is that ability to stay in divergent mode opens up a space for designers to build different thinking skill sets. It's already there. We already have that space. So my question for you is exactly what are you thinking about when you're in that divergent mode? Uh, we don't have to add more time to our work. We have to add a different quality in our work. And so what I want to do is unpack a, a little about uh, systems thinking. Designers should be, and we could be systems thinkers from the perspective of a definition by uh, Wes Churchman and by a lot of other people who come uh, before us who had nothing to do with design and everything to do with, with com complexity, chaos, and, and, uh, and uh, systems. So what I'd like to do in the short time here is talk a little about what that uh, might look like. So it depends on how we think. And, uh, and we come, I like what Chris was uh, saying earlier in terms of uh, HCD has got its uh, our challenges. And we, be th and we need to be thinking about larger ecosystems and about how we are more deeply interconnected with everything we interact with, not just as designers, but as people as well. Uh, and I think that the one thing everybody knows in our program that we look at is, is science, is biology. How does biology work? And a lot of systems thinking emerges from a deeper understanding of the interconnectivity and emergent characteristics that, uh, that are embodied in natural systems. So uh, the question here is, how do designers introduce a way of thinking? A short lecture here, right? Uh, in one single day on systems thinking is not nearly going to be enough. 
So uh, a, a quick introduction uh, we'll, we'll have to do. So within chaos theory and complexity theory and systems thinking, uh, within different realms of systems thinking, there's a simple observation about how nature works. It works in fractals. It works in small, simple things repeated consistently to build complexity. Complexity itself is not complex if you start to look at uh, its, uh, its building blocks. Uh, so, so some simple things to consider, simple rules, repeated frequently, lead to complexity. Now there's a lot, this is a simple observation, a lifetime of learning to understand the implications as a designer. That complexity leads to what we call emergence. The creation of something that is totally unexpected, even though it could have, in hindsight, it might have been predicted. If we understood what was happening in front of us, rather than imagining we understood. So, uh, so it's a great example, uh, Starling Murmurations. Uh, this, uh, I wish I had a video, I'm not technologically advanced to, to provide one, uh, but you've probably seen these. These are series of Starling uh, birds, and they have one simple rule, or a very simple set of rules. And that has to do locally, what's happening to the left, what's happening to the right, what's happening above, what's happening below. And as long as they have a simple understanding and a rule, something comes closer here, move that way. Something comes closer down, move that way. Those simple, simple rules leads to complexity that goes far beyond our understanding, far certainly beyond their understanding as well. So this is a great example of emergent characteristics in natural systems based upon very simple rules. So, um, so we have a great background. Uh, we've already talked about a few people, architecture of complexity. And once again, anybody in the program knows that this is something that, uh, that I enjoy and, and love and I'm passionate about. But uh, Herbert Simon, uh, 50s and 1960s, was talking about the architecture of complexity. And he was asking engineers in this particular case to look at how nature builds itself. And it builds itself with an architecture of complexity. One simple fractal, repeated, repeated, repeated with simple rules that when combined, generate complexity. So this is, uh, it, for, because this is kind of a, a school seminar, it suggests further reading, Herbert Simon, artific, uh, Sciences of the Artificial, and uh, Architecture of Complexity would be something to really dig into. So provocation here. Service design. I love service design, right? We rely on service design in sustainability. Uh, this is, uh, you guys all uh, recognize it's a blueprint. Uh, yes, it is, uh, it is a study and uh, a study of a system and the implementation of design um, uh, interventions into that system. Yes, yes, and yes, right? Well, a kidney is also a system. It's very, very complex. We can study a kidney, uh, a kidney, did I say kidney? Liver. Uh, liver is very complex. We can study it all day long. It does not mean we understand how it works in the body. Right? So then remember, it's a provocation. So very quickly, if we were to ask ourselves, how are we drawing the boundaries around the systems we're studying? Right? Boundaries uh, and boundary distinctions. Uh, it would lead to some simple observations. This is important for designers. This is the world that we live in. However, it is not the entire system. It is impacted and impacts systems around it. And so within our program, and, and I think with a lot of systems thinking, we're asking that question, if we, if we were to remove that line, that boundary distinction, how else does this system interact? And how else does it impact other systems? Uh, and uh, Chris mentioned circular economy. When we look at uh, uh, at systems from a designer's perspective, we are looking at extended systems. We have names for these now, which is wonderful, upstream and downstream. Uh, for every input into that service design blueprint, there is a world of interconnections that, uh, that that system relies on. It may not acknowledge its reliance on it, and that's the challenge. It may not uh, um, acknowledge its reliance, but it relies on it nonetheless. And then after whatever we are designing, whatever intervention we're designing, we, we walk away, we put it in our portfolio, we pat ourselves on the back. It's still generating 
impacts. Maybe we never thought of them. Often we don't. And maybe they're generating some of the larger problems that we're attempting to grapple with in other design disciplines. And these are things that we have to think about. So, uh, so we uh, in, in sustainability, nutrient manager, get rid of the word of industrial designer, think about nutrient manager, because what we're doing is reframing how we think about the materiality of our world. It's not material, it's nutrients. It's nutrients for a social, uh, socio-technological system. If there are nutrients, how do we steward them? How do we manage them? That's a bigger, better question in my mind if we want to be looking at, the, at systems. That's not just the technical systems, it is the human systems. And here too, we have plenty of resources to draw from. Amarchi Sen, being one of many, talks about capabilities and some level of, uh, of equity and equitable distribution. Uh, there are ways you could think whatever materiality here is leading into that, what's necessary in the service, design, uh, the service blueprint is connected intimately with human systems. What are the, our decisions? What kind of impacts do our decisions have on those? So, so this is um, this is funny. This is great. This is not planned. The video that Ricardo showed uh, a little earlier. Um, uh, the Cabreras are probably smiling right now. Uh, I was thinking in a short amount of time, how could we actually uh, demonstrate this uh, these these four rules so quickly? And so you've had a little bit of an introduction to them in that video. This is a great framework. Uh, a lot of systems thinkers are looking for frameworks that have been established, tested, and, and applied. Uh, and this uh, DSRP uh, framework is a wonderful uh, framework to consider. So remember, we said simple rules. So let's look at these. It's kind of like a review now. Distinctions. Distinctions. Things are defined by what they are not. I'm just going to run through each one quickly, and then uh, we can uh, jump into them. Uh, a little deeper. Systems. Every part can be whole in itself. Seems simple. Once you start designing with them in mind and designing to enhance them, it becomes very complex. Relationships. For every action, there is a reaction. And then perspectives. Reality is defined by point of view. Really simple rules, much like the, the uh, starlings right, and murmurations. If we can embody deep knowledge about what these rules might mean, we can become more effective designers uh, from a, a systems thinking perspective. So real quick, we've seen visual, um, uh, you know, kind of uh, uh, illusions, right? You've probably seen this one. This one has been around for a while, David Novick. Each one of those uh, balls is a, the exact same color. Remember, we're talking about rule number one, distinctions. Things are defined by what they are not. Each one of these is the same color. We see them as different colors, not because of them, but because what's around them. All right, so when we come to optical illusions, that's, it's just like, oh, that's cool, right? But how do we embody that deep understanding? Everything that we see is not necessarily that thing as much as what it's not based upon what's around it at that time. Uh, and, uh, and oftentimes we, that's a, a, a fault if we're not careful. A really quick example here in terms of boundary distinctions, what things are and what they're not. People in, in my classes have seen this. I want to try to be really quick here. This is a study because it's not the details that matter. It's just the point. A study of how recidivism increases despite the increase of harsh penalties. Recidivism means people go, who go to prison go back to prison. That increases despite our effort to reduce crime through harsh punishment. In part, it happens because we believe that the system is defined in this small way. We create a harsh punishment, uh, people react, say, oh, let's, uh, let's not uh, uh, get involved in crime. And crime goes down. But when it goes up, that red line, when it goes up, we think we just need more of it. When in fact, we're not defining the boundaries of the problem in the right way. The unintended consequences of that kind of behavior 
drives all kinds of behavior. That drives the creation of crime, not the reduction of crime. It's counterintuitive. Now, does, now, I'm not sitting up here saying there should not be harsh penalties. That's not the question. I'm not saying there should be either. But I'm saying we have to redesign our understanding of our intention and the consequences in order to better understand what's, uh, what we should be doing. So, like, real quick, this is like a very deep thing, but uh, but we, we, we need to uh, keep moving on. Systems, every part can be a, hard, uh, a whole in itself. We talk a lot about what are called polarities in our program. Uh, there's individual people acting in different micros. This is a micro. Your family is a micro. Your, your favorite club on sewing or chess or bowling is a micro. Right? You are interacting from one system to another consistently in larger systems that are interacting, breaking apart, coming back together again consistently uh, within the larger system of say, society or a nation, etc. So an understanding of this, uh, of nested systems and the interconnectivity is an important part of systems thinking. Uh, number two, relationships. Uh, uh, number three, I'm sorry, every reaction, there is a reaction. It's not that simple. Uh, what I mean by that, this is, uh, this is a simple drawing of, uh, of uh, climate uh, change. Greenhouse gas emissions increase, global temperature increases, right? Great. It's not wrong. It's just not complete. The relationships are deeply embedded with each other and generate change in shocking ways because of cause relations or causal relationships. This is what's happening with climate change. All those R's are re what are called reinforcing feedback loops. They actually generate actually generate more rapid change than that simple description that I put up there in front. We're not paying attention to this. We have no understanding of exponential growth, and so we sit around uh, very comfortable in our assumptions that if it changed a little ten in the last ten years, it'll only change a little in the next ten years. So it's a major shortcoming in how we think. And then finally, perspectives. The reality is defined by point of view. I'm sure. I'm thinking you've probably seen this video. It's awesome. Once again, I'm not technologically uh, able to, uh, to get the video on here, but it's a wonderful video. This is a, a two giraffes, right? You, if you're that little girl and you keep going to the side, what you see next to it or what you see on the other side is that. Awesome sculpture, mind-bending sculpture, right? So you're in front of it. You see the two giraffes. You go by it. You see an elephant. You're like, whoa, how did that happen? So that's two views. We have to think that it's not just two views, right? The third view is something like that. So perspective matters. You know, we say that all the time, but how often do you embed your design thinking and, and your design process with the idea that your perception, your point creates a view? That's your view. That's nobody else's view. And that is both physical and conceptual. That's uh, conceptual to social, cultural, uh, familial, etc. All right. So uh, those are the four. Uh, really quick to unpack them here, uh, um, but uh, I encourage you to look further there. And uh, and I think uh, how are we on time? Get like two or three more things. I just want to share. Okay. So designers uh, could be systems thinkers. We absolutely can because we live in that divergent mode. We just have to ask yourselves, what should we, we've been learning to think about when we're in that divergent mode? Uh, real quickly, that's why I asked them, um, uh, two quick, uh, you know, not a lot of time here, but just want to show you just two quick tools on, on how designers think through some of these things. Uh, oftentimes, we're in the lower left-hand corner. Uh, this is uh, developed by Winterhouse because uh, we have, we're having discussions about how we articulate the value of different interventions in complex systems and their consequences. Uh, and so very simply along the bottom, what you have is studying how a single designer interacts with the world when they're developing a single project, a piece of, a piece of furniture or something, what have you. The middle one, interdisciplinary, might be a wonderful SCAD Pro class where you've got uh, illustrators, uh, graphic designers, uh, industrial designers, UX, and so on. Service designers too, right? Of course, you should always be there. Uh, <laughs> seriously. And, uh, and, uh, and so that's interdisciplinary. But then the other side is how often do we work with, uh, with um, nutritionists, 
with policymakers, with um, with people who are, and with anthropologists, specifically in anthropology rather than anthropology kind of coming into design. We have to ask those questions. What kinds of skill sets do we need in that corner? What way of thinking do we need in that corner? And then moving up, you can either be uh, be working on a single object, perhaps a system like a, a, a blueprint, right? Definitely, these are very, remember, don't get me wrong, very complex, uh, very complicated, uh, and very challenging. Uh, and uh, if we move towards culture, how do we deal with diabetes? Right? That doesn't necessarily fit into a system, that fits into cultural frameworks, as, uh, as Sati was talking about. So this, uh, this is a very simple tool of thinking, not only about uh, where we are intervening, but the implications of our interventions, moving one way or another or another, uh, and the opportunities to build skills to be more capable in some of these other sectors. Uh, and then uh, finally, uh, the iceberg, but it, it, it certainly in our program, no systems thinking iceberg, a really important, really simple tool. Uh, what, uh, what we often respond to as people and designers are events. If we're just responding to events, this is a, a reactive stance. Uh, and so if you look further down the iceberg, you have patterns. And usually we're pretty good at, at, at identifying patterns, actually. We can look over the last 10 years. This kind of thing happened so many times. So we need to design something in order to uh, morulate that or to improve it or what have you, right? But how often do we go down to the next level? What's causing those patterns? What's causing the patterns? And this is where, the, in, in, uh, from systems thinking perspective and from our program's perspective, this is where we need to spend our time. What are the underlying structures that are generating the patterns that create the events that we're always reacting to? Right? And, and these, these structures are visible and invisible. They're highway systems and they're structural racism. Right? So this is, uh, this is where we get into a lot of complexity. Those are driven, those are created, whether we'd like to admit it or not, whether we'd like to know or would like to say it or not, are driven by our mental models, are driven by what we believe is right, what we believe is wrong, what we believe should be done, what we believe shouldn't be done. Right? This is the challenging space. And, and, and the, the, the lesson there, and this is, uh, you know, this is, an important lesson that the deeper you go, the more leverage you have, but the more the system pushes back. That's okay. Right? As long as you acknowledge it, right? Work with reality. Don't deny, work with it. You know that the work gets harder once you dig into those spaces. That's all right, because if you're truly looking to drive change, that's where the change occurs. Not easy, not simple, no silver bullet, etc. And then just to bend your mind a little, imagine putting both of those together uh, and then figure out how you might plot your interventions based on on every level. That's just a little, uh, you know, kind of like slamming them together to, to, to force you to think about how complex uh, this gets. So we need tools to, to think this way and, and systems thinking is that. So I'm going to I'm going to end there. This is uh, just quick for those people who don't know. This is how we frame our design for sustainability program. Uh, and, and it does attempt to grapple with these things. It's looking at uh, uh, people plan of prosperity on the right hand side as a solution to space. And then this as the magnificent list of potentials for designers to apply skills based upon context. All right, so this is like a menu that you take one or two of these elements to apply in a context to reach the means within that context. So in any uh, project, no matter what we're looking at, uh, can be improved by thinking through something like this. All right, finally, uh, because like I said, we're in an academic setting, uh, these uh, are influential books. Uh, so uh, uh, we both mentioned uh, Cabrera, the Cabreras. Uh, this is a great book. They also, there's a really interesting piece of software that comes along with this. Um, uh, and then Peter David Stroh, anybody in the program knows I'm passionate about that book, uh, Thinking in Systems. It's just, <laughs> it's, it's just the right first book uh, in my mind. And then I, I hope this doesn't sound um, uh, too self-serving, but I do want to just mention one, two others, but one, <laughs> sorry, but, uh, but I, I, I need to tell you why I put it up here. 
So first necessary revolution, Peter Senge, very much in this, uh, the vein of systems thinking for social change. But then the last one, yes, it's a book I recently wrote. The idea here truly is I'm attempting to take all of this complexity and provide it to designers. And so none of these books are written for designers. Designers have not been paying attention to this stuff. That's one of the reasons why I have these problems. Mm -hmm. So it was an attempt to create a, a vehicle, like an entry point uh, for designers. So that's um, all right. So, uh, so thank you very much.